Okay. Okay. This evening, okay. Okay, let's give a warm welcome to our speaker tonight. He was named after me, <laughs> Howard P. from Arizona. Hi, my name is Howard, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Howard. Hi. I, uh, I'm very glad to be here, and I want to thank everybody that had anything to do with inviting me. Uh, it's really an honor, particularly, to speak here because I know they try to get good speakers. They're not always successful, but they always try. So it's flattering when you're asked. And uh, uh, thank you for that. I, uh, uh, I really, you know, I woke up this morning, and uh, as soon as I realized it was me, <laughs> once again, you know, I felt good about myself. You know, and I felt good about my life, and, and I expected to have a good day. And uh, I hoped that Buzz and I were going to get together, and, and I was, uh, I'm always glad when we can. And uh, it's just turned out to be a good day. And all day long, through the goodness, I've been conscious of the goodness. And that's a total absolute reversal over the way I had lived my life for a lifetime before I got a foothold in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. All of you guys know that uh, when I'm asked, when I'm speaking, I look at my watch from time to time. I don't do that to see what time it is, but I do it to give the secretary a sense of confidence that I care what time it is. <laughs> also, I'm sure you all know that, uh, and probably even the, the newest newcomer knows, that speakers in out we are all speakers in AA. And each one of you that are here, if you're here for the first time tonight, you are an AA speaker. And speakers are not authorities. We just share our experience, strength, and hope. We tell what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. Our primary authority about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is in this blue book. It, it, it describes what we believe as a fellowship, what alcoholism is, and it is our primary description of our program of recovery. Knowing that when I'm asked to speak, I make up stuff and say that it's in the big book <laughs> in order to add credibility to my talk. I make up page numbers. Nobody ever checks. <laughs> when I get through, I hear people say, well, he wasn't much of a speaker, but boy, he sure knew that big book, didn't he? You know? <laughs> On page 45 in the big book, it says, <laughs> it says lack of power is our dilemma. And I know that I lack the power. I know I lack the power to feel good. In and of myself, unaided, I never had a good feeling. I lack the power to be conscious of goodness in my life when there was goodness. My life is good enough now and has been for a long time that I can look back into my past and see that there was goodness there all the time. But I could not know it then. I just knew badness, and I felt bad. I suspect the best feeling I had was a state of low-grade alert. 
about what's going to go wrong next. No. Those were the good days, just like restlessness, irritability, and discontent. That was a good day. Most of them were, were just anxiety-ridden and angry, you know, and, and that, I, I was always that way. I was born in Alhambra, California, but I was raised in a little farm community near Wichita, Kansas, and uh, uh, when I was in grade school there, I saw a movie uh, about training wild elephants in India, and they took, uh, the, primarily they took the baby elephants out first, and they started their training by putting a chain around their right front leg, and they took the other end of the chain and snubbed the baby elephant up to a tree so that he could fight the chain and fight the chain and fight the chain and fight the chain, but he couldn't get loose. Eventually, the baby elephant come to believe that it was futile to fight the chain, so he just stood there. Then they went ahead with the rest of his training, but, but, but when he grew up, they would use the big elephants to harvest the forest. And at the end of the day, from pulling trees up and pulling the trees out of the forest, They'd want to hold them in an area. They'd drive a relatively short stake deep enough in the ground. They'd put a chain around the big elephant's right front leg and the other end of the chain around this relatively short stake. And when the chain got tight on the big elephant's leg, it couldn't pull against the chain. The stake didn't hold the chain. The chain, you know, I mean, the stake didn't hold the elephant, and the chain didn't hold the elephant. The belief, the limiting belief, held the elephant. And I was in AA less than a year, and I heard Don Gates talking about that kind of a thing, and I, I remembered the baby elephant movie, and, and I thought, man, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous with 731,902 approximately, baby elephant beliefs just like that. <laughs> Stuff I believed that I didn't even know I believed, but I behaved as if what I believed was the truth. My automatic behavior was, was as if that was true. The first, and, and I had to look back over my life. I didn't know what I believed. I wasn't aware that I believed that God was an anthropomorphic being up in heaven separate from me. I wasn't aware that I believed that God had created the universe in a manner analogous to me creating snowballs and just throwing them out there, you know. But they were gone then, and, and, and I was on one, and I had to make my life work. I not only had to work and make my life work, but I had to conform to some religious rules that I couldn't conform to. And uh, I didn't feel, none of that made me feel good. I remember the first time I prayed when I knew who I was praying to and what I was praying for. And that was, I was four or five years old in a Methodist church in this little town in Kansas, and we prayed for it not to rain so that the farmers could harvest the wheat the next day. That day, which was Sunday, it rained, and it hailed, and the wind blew, and 90% of the wheat in Sumner County, Kansas, was destroyed. And while nobody pointed at me, I knew whose fault it was. <laughs> I knew who wasn't doing what you had to do to have God answer the prayer, and I... I believed everybody else was doing it. Now, if you're three or four years old or four or five years old and you've assumed the entire responsibility for, control, for destroying the Kansas wheat crop, <laughs> you have an ego problem. <laughs> I had an ego problem. I learned that I wasn't very good at anything. I learned that I, uh, I sh sure wasn't a good son. My dad was uh, an alcoholic, and, and, and dad was German. 
My grandparents came from Germany. I kid about Grandpa on his 66, on their 66th wedding anniversary. Grandpa saying, you know, I love Ma so much that last week I almost told her. <laughs> but I just joke about that because he never almost ever told her. There just wasn't going to be no days when any of those guys told anybody that they loved them. And uh, uh, my dad was uh, uh, rougher than you can get sometimes, and, and he beat me several times. And that didn't make me an alcoholic. But I never got where I liked it. <laughs> there are people I'm not one of those. <laughs> I did not feel good. I didn't feel good about my life until I was 12 or 13 years old and, and I drank a half of a half a pint of whiskey. And it had the same effect for me as it did for nearly every other alcoholic I've talked to. On page 569 in the big book, <laughs> it describes the spiritual experience. And it talks about a change in consciousness followed by a vast change in feeling and outlook. And that's what happened to me when I drank whiskey. I had a spiritual experience. It changed my consciousness from one of fear to one of, of a sense of well-being. And it changed, I had a vast change in feeling and outlook. Everything was all right. And I know also from that same page that when I drank whiskey, it was a true spiritual experience because it also says that these are frequently accompanied by sudden spectacular upheavals. <laughs> mine certainly were. You know, from the very first, mine were clear up to the very last. And uh, uh, the thing about that was I didn't know what was making me sick. I would ask people that I drank with who didn't get sick. One guy said, you need to eat a quarter of a pound of butter before you drink. <laughs> Come on, I ate the butter. You know, I threw the butter up, but I ate the butter. Somebody else said, put bitters in. I did everything to keep from getting sick. And I was sober about a year when, you know, I heard there were was, there was some several words that you never hear in an Al-Anon meeting. Among those words are keen intellect of the alcoholic. You hear that in AA meetings, but not al not meetings. <laughs> I was sober about a year before the keen intellect of this alcoholic realized that it was drinking whiskey that made me sick. I haven't been sick since I stopped drinking whiskey. But all the time I was drinking whiskey, I could not have let myself see that because drinking whiskey was the answer to the problem. It was not the problem. The problems were when I wasn't drinking. There were so many things I couldn't do that I could do well when I drank. 1962, I got a job as an engineer, and I, there was some stuff I was very good at, but I couldn't write technical reports. And just a set of circumstances were that one Wednesday night, I took, uh, uh, 
I, I, I took the work home to write a report at home, and I didn't drink on weekends. I mean, I, I only drank on weekends. I seldom drank during the week then, and uh, mostly I was just the captain of the neighborhood patio parties, you know, but... But this Wednesday night, I had a half a pint of whiskey in the refrigerator, and before I started working on this stuff, I drank about half of it. And all at once, I had innovative ideas about technical report writing. You know, the pieces come together with clarity, and I discovered a technical vocabulary that I didn't know I had. And I wrote this, and I knew it was good. I knew it was. And I read, it was like a textbook, really. And I took it to my boss. Everybody signed it, and, and, and that week my boss called me in and said, did you write this report? And I said, yes, I wrote that report. And he said, I knew you could do it, Howard, if you just give me the effort. And I remember thinking, it was whiskey. It wasn't effort. I had put the effort out before. <laughs> I had given him the effort and I couldn't do it. It was the whiskey, but I knew not to tell him. No. <laughs> if he thinks it's effort, they'll give you a raise for effort. But I knew it was whiskey. And whiskey it was. From then on, anything difficult to do, I just did it with whiskey. And I soon found that you don't have to wait till Wednesday night to start this process. You can start it any day at lunch. <laughs> then I discovered you can start it any time of any day because it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon someplace. <laughs> For me, generally Australia. But... <laughs> Just over a period of time, you know, and it worked. Now, my wife is an Al Anon. Now, I met my wife when we were in the seventh grade. There were 21 of us in the class, and the truth of the matter is, I fell in love with her, I think, as much as you can fall in love with someone. And, uh, and I loved her ever since, except when I hated her. I've loved her ever since. And uh, we got married when I was 20 years old, and I was 19, uh, we were married 19 years when we came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and she needed Al Anon when we were in the seventh grade. <laughs> when she speaks at an Al Anon meeting, her perception of my drinking is much different than my perception of our drinking. I see that I drank and functioned, and that we had fun. And that the fact is, in, in 1962, I was a process analyst. Before long, I was an engineer, a senior engineer. And then I moved from General Dynamics in San Diego to to Hughes and Culver City as kind of a senior, senior engineer, and then I was a, a manager. And that's not setting the world on fire, but, but over a period of eight years, that's a steady progression of promotions. And, and the only reason that I got those is because I drank whiskey. That's the only reason. And, and I knew that. And things were working good up until, for me, up until about 1970. Then my boss became harder and harder to work for. I got drunk one afternoon at noon, and I got, I got drunk one too many times and came back to work, and, and he took exception to that. And so the next time I got drunk at noon, I didn't come back. It turns out that there's very little you can do to please this guy, you know. Uh, and uh, then, then things kind of held their own until uh, uh, 
1972. In 1972, my boss called me in and told me that I was being uh, demoted. I no longer had credibility to, to supervise people. But he didn't fire me. He, he, he gave me a 10% cut in pay, and I was to report to him on spatial assignment. But I was really back on probation, and uh, and life was, you know, life on probation is tough. And and uh, I got drunk one Thursday, and uh, I didn't go back. I got drunk Thursday at lunch, and I didn't go back. I had a brilliant idea of what I was going to say to him. It was Tom, Buzz remembers Tom Duhamel, and I was going to explain it to him, and I didn't come back Friday. And of course, I didn't go in Saturday or Sunday, and on Monday, I woke up, and I had had it. I knew I had had it. I had had it. And I can't drink today. I've got to go in and see if I can dig my way out of this. But I remember when I got in the car knowing that. And the next time I knew I'm not going to drink today was I, was I had stopped by the tattletale on the way to work and I was ordering my second double when I thought I wasn't going to drink at all today. And then I said, to hell with it. I'm drinking today. And I don't care what the consequences are. If I end up on Skid Row, somehow the people on Skid Row drink. And that's what I'm going to do. And I sat there all day long. I didn't get that drunk. And I went home and told my wife, some people are born to drink. And I'm one of those. <laughs> I don't care what the consequences are. If now, Pat used to, for a long time, she would threaten to leave me. And, and I will tell you that that came as near as anything to keeping me in line because I did not want her to leave me. I did not want to lose her. And, and by then, we had three kids, and I didn't want to lose any of them. Uh, uh, but I told her that day, I don't know what the consequences are. I don't care. You can go to a lawyer, do whatever you want. Have everything put in your name if you're worried about it. But I'm going to drink. The next morning, I got a man. I did not want her to go to the lawyer. I did not want any. I did not want to go to Skid Row. <laughs> I, am, I am not going to drink today. I'm going to work. And I, you know, and I went to work. I didn't drink. And I discovered that my boss had had to leave work Thursday afternoon and had not come back until this very morning. And nobody knows I wasn't even there or cares. <laughs> How could have I blown this so far out of proportion? I have no trouble at all. Except I haven't had a drink yet today. You know, now I've got... You know, I drank that day, and I went home and said to Pat, did you go see the lawyer? She said, yes. I said, are you getting stuff put in your name? And she said, he said, we don't have anything. <laughs> Except a mortgage, which he said to leave in your name. He also told her that your husband sounds like he's an alcoholic. Why don't you just get him to go to AA? And I said, when she told me that, well, of course, but AA is for people that are in trouble with their drinking. I'm not in trouble with my drinking. If ever I get in trouble with my drinking, I'll go to AA. But I wasn't in trouble. Tom hadn't been to work for two days either. <laughs> After that, I, I drank way too much, and I took too many of a thing called desbutol, or uppers. 
and amphetamines. The chef at Regal of amphetamines is Desbutal. <laughs> Did you ever do those, Paul? <laughs> they, the government took them off the drug market because they have absolutely no medicinal value. There's no, <laughs> there's no disease known to man. But I ended up, after a weekend, of, and I'd never drank wild turkey before, and I drank wild turkey. It was, it was a tremendous weekend. And I ended up where my right leg would turn to rubber every once in a while. <laughs> and I never knew when it was going to do that, you know. I'd walk down the hall and, you know, and <laughs> very close to what a ballet dancer would call a pirouette. <laughs> and I was seeing double. I hadn't had anything to drink or any mind-altering substance for three days, and I was still seeing double. And my son took me to a doctor, and he said, uh, how much do you drink? I said, I don't drink at all. I, I didn't. I hadn't had a drop for three days. And a little bit, he said, well, if you drink, I'd know what was wrong. I said, that ain't it. Let's get to looking for some serious causes here. And uh, a little later, he said, are you sure that you don't drink? And I called him all kind of SOBs, and I was just absolutely mad at him, and I stomped out of his office, you know. <laughs> but I knew I wasn't going to drink again. I knew that I had, I, now, within a week, my leg is working good, and I can focus my vision again, you know. Marvelous recovery. Uh, and then my boss gave me a difficult assignment that I was just immobilized. I couldn't think how to get started. I... I was uh, just terrified by it, and I thought, well, I'm going to take a drink, but this time it's going to be different. I'm just going to baby a half a pint through the day. Well, before this was over, this time was different. I, I had a convulsive seizure this time, and that was different. <laughs> it was sure different for Pat. She just became like a fawn in a forest fire then, you know, just, and it was then that she, she knew I was going to die, and she was just waiting for it, you know, and uh, I was hopelessly in debt, I simply wasn't making enough money to pay the bills that I had to pay, and uh, I had an opportunity to sell some equipment that I didn't own. Equipment that I found right before the owner lost it. And I gave it to this other guy to sell, and he was going to give me half of the money. Nine days had gone by, and I didn't get anything for it yet, and that was a Sunday. And I had paid my tab in the tattletale on Friday, and this was two days later, and I'm further into the tab now than I had been before I paid the bill. And uh, I'm double the limit on a, a, a credit card my wife didn't know I had, and I had borrowed money from the credit union on previous occasions to pay the credit card down so that I owed the credit union out into infinity, so I didn't have any hope of having any money, and I uh, uh, tried to sell some more equipment. <laughs> Only I tried to sell it in the tattletale. This was basically a pocket of industrial giants in there that uh, <laughs> could not keep the TV set tuned in so you could see it. I don't know what I thought they'd do with test equipment, but. But the next morning when I woke up, 
I just, I, I felt terrible every morning that I woke up, but this was the worst. And I realized I shouldn't have gone into the tattletale and talked about selling electronic test equipment when they knew that I worked in an electronic test lab. <laughs> Then it dawned on me that Hughes did not own that test equipment, that the government of the United States of America owned it. It was government furnished property to Hughes to be used on a government contract. And it was above the discriminating amount that would involve ultimately two agents from the Federal Bureau of Investigation Santa Monica office coming looking for what the hell happened to the government's property. And I re realized all this that Monday morning, and I experienced what is called, described on page 30 <laughs> as a feeling of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I truly saw what a disgrace. I, I was not a thief, you know. I was, but man, that wasn't even in the cards, and there I was, and it wasn't just a as a thief, but a stupid one that had stole stuff <laughs> and hadn't gotten any money for it, and that if I got caught, I wasn't just a disgrace, but my, my whole family would be disgraced. I remembered kids that I went to school with whose father was in prison, and that's the way we knew that whole family. They're the family of the guy in prison. And uh, I would lose my security clearance if I didn't go to a federal penitentiary. I'd never get another job. Man, I've got to stop drinking until this blows over. <laughs> then I remembered Pat's thing about going to AA. So I called this guy that I thought was the president of Alcoholics Anonymous worldwide. For the, for the newcomers, you are as close as we're going to come to being president or having a president worldwide. You are it. We just don't have that. But I needed to know that this guy was the president because I wouldn't have called a lesser light. And I called him and, you know, in my growing up, a baby elephant belief happened to me that I had no idea about. And that was that it became important to me to be right. And then it became important to me that you know I'm right. And if you believe something different than I believe, it became important to me that you know you're wrong. <laughs> I became, without any basis in fact to support this, I had become a person who already knows it all. I'm a little hurt hearing. And... Uh, That's the only wristwatch that I have that has an alarm that I can hear. <laughs> the rooster that you may have heard crowing <laughs> tells me that I better hustle if we're going to get sober here. So, uh, So I called this guy and he said he'd take me to the first AA meeting and he said, don't get drunk or I can't take you. And I did get drunk and I got in his pickup and I said, I am not an alcoholic. And he smiled and said, I don't know if you're an alcoholic or not, but we're going to the right place. And he took me to the Culver City Studio Group, and uh, which met at the Woman's Club at that time. And uh, I was warmly welcomed at that meeting. And uh, everybody told me that I was in the right place. One guy said, 
when I told him I'm not an alcoholic, he said, you know, you don't have to be an alcoholic to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't have to think you are, and you don't have to say you are. The only requirement for membership here is a desire to stop drinking, and only you know if you have that desire. And if you know you have that desire, and you want to be a member, then vote yourself in, because that's how everybody that's a member here got in. They vote themselves in. And he said, whether you're here or not, your place will always be here. And uh, nobody could take my place in Alcoholics Anonymous. He said that. Nobody could take your place, Howard, in AA. What a tremendous thing for him to say, really. And I knew he meant it. And I had that good feeling going for me. And then I heard him read chapter 5. And I just give you this as an example. We're going by this watch. Uh, it's because I can't see that clock. But uh, uh, they read chapter 5, and they came to that place that says, Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. And my mind said to me, cunning is not an attribute that you can assign to an inanimate substance such as alcohol. Cunning requires intellect. Alcohol has no intellect. They've got that wrong. Two lines later, they say, but there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. I said, because I learned this when I was a baby elephant. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous don't use the word God. They use the words higher power. I must be in the wrong branch. You see? Because if you know it all, you know those things. And, and then I said, they just got through saying, I said to myself, they just got through saying alcohol was powerful. Then they said God has all power. Well, if God has all power, then alcohol can't have power. And if alcohol has power, God cannot have all power. He can just have all power except what alcohol has. <laughs> when I'm doing this, I'm missing a lot of stuff that could <laughs> save my life. But that's the way I am. You see? That's what makes me hopeless, and that's what makes me helpless. And anybody that I had ever gone to for help or anybody that ever come to help me before had sooner or later had to tell me what was wrong with me. They had to tell me what I was doing wrong before they could tell me what to do right. And as soon as they told me what I was doing wrong, I hated them. Even if I knew I was doing it wrong, I hated them and I would just invalidate everything else they said. They could not help me. But I came here, and you guys have invariably told me what was wrong with you, what your life used to be like, what happened to you, and what your life is like now. And you have done that so remarkably well that I can see myself in your reflection. And I, you know, like, it, it was like Norm, like, like no, I heard Norm speak very early. I heard Doris Ransom speak at my first AA meeting at, uh, in Culver City. Uh, and and uh, I'll never forget, I'll never forget that. Uh, but what Norm said that he came to AA, you know, oh, he described himself as the vice president and general manager of the Midnight Auto Supply in the San Gabriel Valley. Said I was a car thief and I thought, Man, I'm just like this guy. You know, I didn't steal cars, but I'm just like it. He was born in the San Gabriel Valley. I was. It was a lot of, of biographical similarities. And, uh, 
And then he said, I came to AA and I learned to give a little. And he said, I'm not a giver by nature. I'm a taker by nature. I'm a taker of things and a user of people. I'm a loser because I'm a taker and takers are losers. And you're looking at one right here. When he said that, I knew that I was a taker and a loser. I was a taker of things and a user of people. That's what I was. I was just like Norm, you see. If Norm would have said, Howard is a taker of things and a user of people, I would have hated him and he couldn't have helped me. But he told me about him and I saw me. Now he's on the sunny side of the street, you know. And he's going to go home and his red-headed wife, my wife's red-headed, is going to be glad to see him. And then he's going to take his daughter down to the department store and buy her a palm dress and high-heeled shoes. And uh, someday he's going to buy her a wedding dress. And, and I've got a daughter, you know, and someday I'd like to buy her a wedding dress and walk her down the aisle. Norm said, just like I walked her sister and she'll marry some jackass. And <laughs> I leave a meeting with a sense of optimism that I didn't know I had, you know. And I go home and Pat and I didn't fight when I went home from an AA meeting and she came home from an al meeting. It was a different thing. And, and, and it was that way and we didn't realize it. Uh, they described alcoholism at my first meeting and I knew that I was an alcoholic. I uh, lost the ability to control my drinking. I was obsessed with the idea that somehow, some way, this time I'm going to drink a half a pint. You know, I'm just going to drink a half a pint. Uh, and I saw that I had that obsessive thought. I did not see that I had a phenomenon of craving, and I told the guy that took me to the meeting that I don't think I ever craved a drink. And he said, you mean if you drank a half of a half a pint, you wouldn't crave another drink? And I said, no. I would want one, but I wouldn't crave it. You see, I had seen Ray Milland in The Lost Weekend, and <laughs> that was my criteria of what a craving was, and that had never happened to me. And Kenny said, there's a class of alcoholic that many of them are in AA, and he said, that's the class who, when they start to drink, keep slugging them down so fast that the craving doesn't have an opportunity to get a foothold. <laughs> I, I, you know, I tell that I always get a lot of nods. Uh, you know, that's the kind I am. And then they talked about God. And one of the things they said about God was, well, they read it on page 93, that paragraph that says, to emphasize to the newcomer that whatever concept of the higher power that the newcomer had, it would work for him provided it makes sense. And then they talked about uh, different people shared different things about their concept of God. And it was working for them. But I could see my concept of God did not fit in the, the, the 12 steps. And that I wasn't going to do the 12 steps. And AA wouldn't work for me. And I told Kenny when I got in the truck, well, I'm an alcoholic, all right, but AA won't work for me. And I'm not going to do any of the steps. And he said, why won't it work? And I said, well, that stuff about God. I said, I'm not an atheist, but my concept of God is that God is immutable law that underlies the universe. And inherent within the law, is unlimited intelligence and power so that things happen exactly in accordance with the requirements of the law. Things do not yield to prayer. My God does not change things in order to accommodate people and their problems. And it looks to me like your steps require a God that listens to prayer and changes things. Mine don't even fit in that. He said, that's terrific, Howard, but can you not drink? I said, yes, I cannot drink. He said, don't take Benny's either. I don't even know how he knew I was taking Benny's. <laughs> Unless he noticed I said the same things over and over again real fast. <laughs> he said, when you... Uh, 
He said, I should never say this to a newcomer. I, next month I'll celebrate, Kenny said, the next month I'll celebrate in my eighth year of sobriety and I have a wonderful life. And I believe I have a wonderful life because God has given me that through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. said, that's just what I believe. But he said, I've been sober nearly eight years and I have yet to do a written in fourth step. And I just tell you that to tell you that it's possible to have as good a life as I have and not do the fourth step yet. I don't want you to do it that way. But I'm just telling you that that's what happened to me. So don't worry about the fourth step or that. He said, what has worked best for me to start with was I would go to meetings, I would not drink, and not take bennies, and I would listen to the people sharing. And if one of them described a course of action that did not appeal to me, I respected them for sharing it, and I hoped that somebody would be helped, but I would leave it. But he said, time and time and time and time and time again, I have listened for them to describe a solution to a problem that I didn't even realize I had until I heard their solution and I knew that if I would have practiced that in my life in that set of circumstances, I think my life would be better. And then in those sets of circumstances, I get as close to that as I can and it does work. And he said, over a period of time, I have a good life. So he said, don't worry about that stuff just don't drink and, and let's go to meeting. And, and uh, I did and I got laughs. I hurt so bad the first time I heard Johnny talk and right at the place where I was about to bust something, he said something funnier than he had ever said before. And it was just painful but delightful. And I knew for certain that this was something that I'm glad I hadn't missed. I, just for the newcomer, okay, for the newcomers, let me tell you some things I heard when I first came in that fits the pattern of Kenny. I heard Steve, well, I heard Tommy O when the meeting was still over on Wasika, I heard Tommy O say, if you make one mistake and brood about having made that mistake, you've made two mistakes. Man, you know, and the brooding is generally the worst consequence of the mistake. And I saw that. I learned that here. Made sense to me. I heard Archie say, I am so busy today wanting what I'm getting that I don't have time to worry about getting what I want. And he said, in AA, we try to live our lives in the now. And whatever is happening right now, he said, I try to love that because that's what's going to happen anyway. <laughs> and, and hating it just makes the problem worse for me. My thought was, let's jab him in the eye with a sharp stick. <laughs> because, because that's the kind of person I was. I, you know, but I'll tell you this, you know, I was, let's put that to a test, you know. We got, in engineering, we test these principles. Let's, I uh, went out to the car, it was at the Palisades meeting, and it was raining. And I'd hated the rain since I'd wiped out the wheat crop. And uh, I got in the car and decided to love the rain. It's raining now, I know not liking the rain. And it was that easy, it was that easy, and I went home and went to bed, shut the lights out, went to bed, heard the rain on the roof, it was soothing for me. I loved the rain. And then I went to sleep and I woke up and it wasn't raining, and I didn't like it for a second, and then I knew, hey, you gotta like it not raining, you know? You gotta make those attitude adjustments, you see? And I've gotten better at it. I've gotten better at that, but I got a foothold on that here in AA. I heard Ski from San Diego say he was 36 years in learning that all the people that he hated didn't feel it. <laughs> the next meeting I went to, they said, does anybody have a problem they want to discuss? And my hand went up. That's happened twice in 25 years. My hand went up and I said, how do you not hate people? 
There may have been 20 people in the meeting, and one of them I remember, and that was Patty. And Patty said, I just heard, Howard, that you can't be hateful and grateful at the same time. And if you're a sober member in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a basis for gratitude, but you got to work for it. I remembered that. And later on, I was telling everybody I didn't pray. God don't have ears. God don't change anything. One guy said, uh, did you ever try to meditate? He said, I never liked prayer much, but I learned to meditate, and that's helped me. I said, how do you meditate? He said, well, read chapter 11 and the 12 and 12. And I read chapter 11, and that's prayer. St. Francis of Assisi prayer. But <laughs> I ain't going to do that. But at the same time, Bill describes a meditative process that involves positive imagination. And anyway, what I started to do in, in times of crises, which was relatively frequent, <laughs> was get up early enough in the morning so that I could bring into my consciousness the truth of what the first seven months of my life was like in 1972, what the last seven months of my drinking was like, when all the character and quality of every circumstance and event of my life was disintegrating, it was plummeting, and there was nothing in my life to stop it. My bottom was when there was no bottom, and there was nothing in my life to stop the plummeting. And then I would bring into my consciousness that the day I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, the plummeting stopped. Now, my feelings didn't turn around, but the plummeting stopped. My sponsor helped me track down that equipment that I'd stolen and sold, and I brought it back, and I, my boss let me off the hook by saying the next morning, if anybody had really stolen this, I wouldn't have it, and I have it. But there are no provisions for stealing stuff and bringing it back. So don't ever tell anybody that you stole it. And I haven't. <laughs> but in those mornings of crisis, I could bring the good I felt the next morning into my car. The weight of the world was off my back. I was no longer a candidate for a hard time in the federal penitentiary. My family would never be disgraced by that. What a deal, you know? What a deal. And I felt good about it, and every time I brought it into my consciousness after that, I felt good about it. And more and more things started happening. I knew I had friends here. I had people that respected me. I was always welcome here. I just had, and I'd bring those things in, and I'd have a sense of gratitude and a sense of optimism for maybe 15 minutes, you know, and then I'd have a rotten day, but that was a tremendous way for me to learn to start the day. Now, in October of 1974, I read in the 12 and 12 that we learned we had to stop using our higher power as some kind of a bush league pinch hitter, and I knew that bringing God into my life and because you see, I would stop meditating. I'd just do it for a while, and then I'd skip it, you know, and then I'd have to fight my way out of the corner again. And, and uh, so I made a decision in October of 1974 that there wouldn't be a day pass in my life that I don't spend at least 30 minutes bringing into my consciousness the strength, the spiritual strength that I have been given through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's gotten bigger and better year after year. And I've kept that commitment. I have kept that commitment. I haven't missed a day. I, I, I just haven't missed a day of spending at least 30 minutes in prayer meditation since October 1974. And... Uh, that has, that has been a great source of strength to me. My sponsor, Johnny, Johnny's sponsor, John, said one time, it's just a kind of a throwaway line, I think I would miss the payoff in AA if I didn't meditate. That's a hell of a thing to say to somebody like me, because you know then, I don't want to miss the payoff. You know. <laughs> 
Now, I will just tell you, I am absolutely convinced that I would have missed the payoff. I would have missed the payoff if I hadn't found this thing on uh, these things, you know, particularly the meditation. I'd have missed it. But I didn't miss it. I have it. I have a great life. I've run out of time some time back, I think. I'm always afraid to look. I am right. Let me just tell you, I was reading a book. By the way, I, I want to say that I still basically have the same concept of God that I had the night I come in. My concept makes sense to me. It's just that it fits the AA program. Gradually, it became clearer and clearer to me that God didn't have to change anything in order to accommodate me and my problem. God did not have to change anything in order for me to have the rich life that I have. God didn't have to change anything for the Wright brothers to fly their first airplane because God's laws of evolution gave a growing intelligence to guys like Orville and Wilbur Wright who began to grasp the laws of aerodynamics in this very atmosphere and how to apply them. You know, God didn't change anything. It all came together wonderfully. And Dr. Bob and Bill were inspired to know spiritual principles which we as alcoholics are able to engage in our lives through doing the deal in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It enriches my life beyond anything that I could have ever imagined. I had to change, and up till then I had no way to change. I had no power to change. I lacked the power. I have the power. I have the power to feel good. I have the power to be grateful. Whatever, this book says, whatever way you find God, that's the right way. But remember, Wherever you see God pass, mark that spot and go sit in that window again. This is my window. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I first saw God pass. I never, I think God's passing throughout everything that exists in the universe. But I'm not as conscious of it as I am when I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. How wonderful that is for me, and I thank you for it. 